Brother Joe and I are delighted to have had the opportunity to have been a part of what the Lord has been doing here at Cape Hon, uh during this week. It's always good to be able to be where Wayne and Ruth are, to be a part of the ministry that God has through them. In addition to being very close friends in the natural realm, they are especially close to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, I love you, and I appreciate you. We want to thank the council ring for inviting us to come. It has just flat out been a blessing uh, to be here, to see the folks that make this camp up, uh, the way you've received us and loved us at a time when we probably needed loving on just a little bit. And we appreciate your prayers and appreciate what God is doing through you. And to be able to meet such a sweet lady as young Thelma and to have the high privilege of uh, sharing in ministry with you has been a sheer delight. And I thank you. Love you. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Betty Joe and I both have really been tremendously blessed. And uh, we plan to be here next year just to be with you. And uh, we've already, I think, put in our bid for the whole house down there <laughs> so that we can bring other folks to be with us just to be a part of your camp and uh, of what God's doing here. Uh, it's really a blessing. Thank you. Martha. I love you, darling. Thank you for saying that. But it's been a joy, and I sure do thank you for it. Um, I'd made up my mind that, that, that you know, I was going to be serious about this this morning. <laughs> no, I, I really, I, what I meant was, <laughs> dag, I meant something. Uh, what I meant was, I think I was going to be straight about it. Uh, I have had things come to my mind uh, during this week that I hadn't thought of in a long, long time. I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I really haven't. And do you ever get mad with a, with a dog because it wouldn't fly? <laughs> or, a, or a bird because it didn't bark? Do you ever do that? I mean, anybody with any common sense knows that a bird flies because it's, it's the nature, isn't it, of the bird to fly? And it's the nature of the dog to bark. And that the only way that the bird's going to fly, I mean, the bird's going to bark and the dog's going to fly, is for them to have a radical change or transformation in nature. Isn't that right? So that then you get a, get a bird dog. <laughs> Isn't that right? Ain't that good, Wayne? That's, I thought that was profound. Wayne didn't think that was profound. Hallelujah. That's why you get a rabbit dog, too, Daisy. Daisy, I ain't never seen a rabbit dog. Oh, yeah, they chase rabbits. Oh, Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, in reflecting on what was on my heart to leave with you uh, this morning, since Betty Joe and I will be leaving this afternoon, we have a missions conference at our church, and I feel the need to be there. My wife is reluctantly agreeing to go uh, with me. Uh, but uh, reflecting on the, the need to leave you and wanting to leave with you what was really on my heart about a number of things, uh, I thought that this would be what perhaps I ought to leave with you. And it really is sort of at the heart and soul of why I do what I do on a daily basis. Uh, I have come to the realization, as you have, that if any person at any time will for any moment of time receive Jesus into their hearts, 
that Jesus will transform them into a new creature. That's absolutely reliable. For one millisecond, you open up your heart to the Holy Spirit, and he's going to bust you wide open with a new nature, the nature of Christ. That's exciting to me. And I think uh, looking back over the years, some of the struggles that I have had in the body of Christ with people uh, in local churches and in other situations that we gather together in fellowship in uh, is that we have been deceived by Satan into believing that what is offered to us is change when in fact what God provides for us is transformation. And there really is a distinction between the two. And I suspect over the past three or four years, uh, this has sort of been on my heart kind of heavy because as I look around and see people of different walks trying to be molded into a certain kind of category and fitted to suit other people, and I find people pressing in to bring change, what happens to us is that when we can get people changed into what we think they ought to be, then we back off and let them go. When in fact, what we need to be doing is to press in by the power of the Spirit to see transformation take place. Because change isn't that hard to get. It's hard to take, but it's really not that hard to get. You know, for example, uh, if you've got a 13-year-old kid that's really giving you a hard time, right? I mean, their behavior is obnoxious. You're sick of it. You'd really like to swat them right between the eyes with a big chain or tie toe, you know? You feel it in your spirits. You want to do something loving and kind to them so as to get their attention, right? You would really like for their behavior to change. Well, see, changing behavior is not a problem. All, all you have to do is to strap your 13-year-old in a chair, and, and, and just use no, no anesthetic and just pull all the teeth on one side. Uh, and every time they see you, they'll flinch. And every time you say move, they'll move because they don't want the other side pulled. You can get changed. The only way really that you got to act in order to get changed with people is to increase the pleasure to the point where they want that more than they want what they were holding on to, and they'll turn loose of that and lay hold of what you're offering. Or increase the pain to the point where they can't stand it anymore. And then they'll lay hold of what you want rather than holding on to what they have. Isn't that right? And if you want change, if that's all you want, then that's cool. You can get change. But that's not what the Scripture talks about. That's not what Jesus offers. What Jesus offers is transformation. Transformation takes place on the inside, right? One of my favorite persons in terms of reading uh, that I have read over and over again, and the only two books I know he's written in Manifest Victory and Perfect Everything, is that Rufus Mosley is very clear in his own statement in that you know, Christianity is an inside job. That what takes place on the outside in terms of change is the end result of transformation that's taking place on the inside. But if you get change on the outside without transformation on the inside, then the change is only going to last as long as the pleasure or the pain. You, know, you all right? Serious business, ain't it? Don't be serious. We had to deal with this in our own lives, Betty Joe and I. Uh, we're still dealing with it a lot. Um, praise God, we're at a different place than we have been with it ever before. But uh, this sort of came home to us a number of years ago when I was struggling through some things with my oldest son. And um, my wife had suggested that we needed to go see somebody uh, likened to the profession that, that Coop and, uh, and Jackie have. Uh, affectionately known as shrinks, where I come from, uh, so that, uh, you know, that I felt like John needed it. John felt like I needed it. By the time we got through with one another, Betty Joe was convinced both of us needed it. So we decided to give it a shot, and uh, we did, and John went through some work there, and uh, I went in every now and then to make sure that the psychologist was convincing John just how sorry he was, and and how much help he really needed. And we sat in on a session when they were finishing things up, and the uh, man looked at John, and he said, uh, Are you the sorriest? Boy, I've seen in a long time. You don't have an ounce of initiative. You are lazy. And I'm over there saying, Well, bless God, oh boy, the old boy knows something. And uh, then he said uh, to John, we are going to change your behavior. And again, on the inside, I'm saying, glory to God. <laughs> you know, this is good. Because by that time, even change would have been a relief. You know? 
You do know, don't you? <laughs> so I'm saying, that's wonderful, but about the time I got thrilled about hearing that, uh, the Spirit, I think, began to move in a rather strong kind of way, and everything that was hot inside of me got cold, and I sort of heard the Lord say, uh, you don't want change. Uh, you want your boy to have a new heart. You, you want transformation. And somehow in the years, in preaching and teaching and ministering, my heart has been to see people transformed. And Jesus is the only person who can do that. Transformation and change. Really kind of interesting in the body of Christ. You know, sometimes we feel like that if we can get everybody doing what we do the way we do it, looking good, smelling good, sounding good, you know, setting up right in the pews, if we can just sort of get everybody into that kind of mold, then we feel like we got it going our way. Well, it's God's way or not, it's another matter, but at least we got it going our way, and it feels good. We have a tendency to settle for change, to even push for change rather than for transformation. The Word says, don't be conformed, be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, we had the privilege of being up in a place called Northeast on a number of occasions, not far from where Dick and Betty are. And y'all are precious. Y'all are two of the sweetest people I have known. Really do love y'all. Y'all are special. But we're up there doing a meeting at a place called the Northeast at a Methodist church. And uh, I'd been there, I think, for about three or four years. And they had a young boy there by the name of Jesse Crockett. And Jesse was mean as a snake, honey. I mean, the boy was rough. He was about this high, built like a fire plug, didn't have no neck, you know? Just strong and healthy, at least in body, if not in spirit and mind. And uh, I had sort of made Jesse an object of my affection every time I had been there, just to love on Jesse and share with him. Uh, Jesse kind of person like to slap people, you know? Just for the fun of it. Watch him be in pain when he got through. Uh, kept his mama kind of nervous, you know, on the inside, not knowing where she was going to get him delivered from, you know, in the middle of the night. And um, Jesse was quite a baseball player, um, rated the best catcher in three states up there, talented dude, but mean as a snake. And we'd been there that week, and we had preached, uh, and it was a good Methodist church because that last night when we gave the invitation, nobody came. And... Uh, <laughs> I look back there, and we're waiting around for something to happen. And uh, Kenny Davis was with me. And if you ever met Kenny, Kenny, Kenny's just not afraid of anything, honey. I mean, Kenny is kind of person, a little bit like Wayne, where he would pour oil on a stump and expect a stump to get up and walk. I mean, the boy does not know any fear. So we give the invitation, waiting around for beautiful things to happen, and uh, Kenny's over here, and up at the end of that service, Kenny Davis got up and started to move and move. And when I look down now, here comes Jesse. Now, Jesse uh, was not exactly what Kenny was looking forward to seeing <laughs> because he didn't know what to do with Jesse. Really didn't. So old Jesse came, knelt down, and in a few minutes, Kenny was behind the altar rail, and I don't know whether Donna and Don were there that night or not, uh, but anyway, Kenny came over the altar rail and had Jesse by the head <laughs> and was shaking him. And I thought, well, the boy has lost his mind. But in a few minutes, as they began to pray together and God began to move, the Lord broke down into little old Jesse's heart, and the love of God set him free. And in that moment of time, old Jesse was transformed. He became a new creature. Now, Mama got happy, I got happy, his Uncle Paul got happy, everybody got happy. Jesse was a piece of work, honey, and to have God break in his life, bring transformation to give him a new nature, was something to behold. 
Well, now, I was trying to talk Jesse into going to school with my oldest boy because Jesse was the one person I knew mean enough to slap John every morning before breakfast. <laughs> so I felt like if they could room together in college that it'd be a blessing to John, you know? <laughs> so Jesse agreed to go down there, and uh, they ended up rooming together for one semester, and I really don't know who got slapped most or... What happened, but after one semester, they parted. <laughs> but then I want you to hear was, after we'd sort of made arrangements for Jesse to come down there to college, I called back up to talk to Jesse's uncle to find out how Jesse was doing, you know, after he'd accepted the Lord and his transformation had taken place. And uh, so I asked him, you know, how's Jesse doing? He said, Wes, he's doing all right, but he got in a little trouble at school. And I said, well, what kind of trouble did he get in? He said, Wes, it wasn't all that bad, but... He did cause a little problem. And what had happened was that Jesse was in his biology class, and the teacher was talking about evolution and creationism and had simply said that the Bible was, was myth and fiction and that evolution was scientific fact. When old Jesse said, he's transformed, but his mind ain't renewed yet, right? <laughs> and so he stands up and he takes exception. To this, and the only way that he knows how to take exception, he says, there ain't nobody in here that I can't whip, <laughs> including you, talking to the teacher, and there ain't nobody in here what if I took you out in the hall, they wouldn't have to call the wagon to come get you. But now for old Jesse, that's transformation creeping to the outside with his mind expressing what he feels in the only way that he knows how. The thing that excites me about transformation is that it means that no matter where I go, no matter who I see, no matter what they're into, no matter how scuzzy they are, no matter how bright they are, no matter how many three-piece suits they own, or how many Porsches or, 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 or Mercedes they drive, no matter what they're into in terms of pursuit of happiness, no matter what they understand to be real, that if for one moment they'll open their hearts to Jesus, they'll be transformed. That's exciting to me. You know what that means? That means, honey, every day there's a new opportunity to see a new creature birth into the kingdom. Now, that might not thrill you, when I drive up to McDonald's, I get thrilled about that. When I go to any restaurant to eat, it is my intention to witness to the waitress or the waiter or to anybody that's sitting close to me. That's an opportunity, honey. You know what I mean? You do. Some of you don't. It's thrilling to look at anybody and know that if they are not yet a new creature, if they will for one moment accept Jesus by the grace of God, they will be transformed. That's the hope of what we're all about, honey. Because if you have been transformed, you are still in the process of being transformed through the renewing of your mind. That's part of why you are here in CFO, is that your mind, what, might be renewed. Why? Because what happens at the point of that new nature is simply this. When you accept Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you, and from that point on, the Holy Spirit is working to give you the mind of Christ, to renew your mind. Satan, on the other hand, is doing all he can do to give you the mind of the world so that you won't be transformed, but rather that you would be conformed to the world. And part of your reason for being here is that you would continue your transformation. You would continue to have your mind renewed. And the truth of the matter is, the extent to which you walk in transformation has to do with what you feed yourself in your mind. Isn't it true? Y'all help me. It is, ain't it? So that your spirit on the inside is hungry for the things of God. And as you feed yourself the things of God, then your spirit continues to renew your mind and you continue to walk out that transformation that's taking place on the inside. That's exciting to me. I think it was a year after you left family camp that I was supposed to direct it. Isn't that right? It was, I think. Uh, and I went down to this camp, 
And I ran into the meanest, ugliest, most obnoxious 14-year-old boy I've ever met in my life. Now, when I say obnoxious, honey, I mean obnoxious. The boy was bad news. Now, I did everything I could do to love on him and love on his mama and daddy. What I really wanted was for his daddy to grab a big stick, <laughs> which I don't think he had ever done. And I really wanted to encourage his mama, with all due respect, to hush and let daddy get the stick. But now it was obvious that mama wasn't going to let daddy get the stick, right? Well, now, once they got to the camp, then it was my responsibility to a degree to have some authority in this young man's life. Wouldn't you think so? Thank you. I've been feeling bad about that now for several years. <laughs> I, I feel better now that you feel I had some authority in that boy's life. But now this boy had brought with him an amplifier, a bass guitar, a big box, and some weird tapes. And he was in our youth cabin, right? And he liked to play his stuff, you know? Well, it wasn't good stuff. And he didn't just play it for himself. He played it for everybody in camp at 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning. He played it whenever he felt good about playing it, as loud as he wanted to play it, and he didn't care what anybody else thought, right? So I go to him, and I say, Brother, this is uncool. <laughs> you can't do this. You're infringing on the rights of everybody else here, son. you got to quit playing your stuff, because if you don't, I'm going to take your stuff. <laughs> so he didn't, and I did. Well, now this made this unregenerate young man very angry. And I happened to come upon him when he had come upon two of our counselors. And he was in the midst of questioning the heritage when I got there. Well, you know, being the director of the camp, I was somewhat offended for my counselors. Wouldn't you be? So when I began to explain to him that that is not appropriate behavior, he began to question my heritage. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression. <laughs> if you've heard, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, getting some magic and spit. Now, I'm sure you haven't because you look like a classy bunch of people. But we had taken this young man with us from Bethel uh, named Daniel Keel, who's six foot four. My daughter calls him a hunk. Man, and he loves the Lord. And he was standing over there listening to what this boy was saying to me. And I looked over, and all Daniel could do was stand there and spit. He was just. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that if I didn't do something, that Daniel was going to separate this boy from his spirit. <laughs> so I said to him, son, uh, you go on down to the youth cabin and pack your mess. You're moving in with your mom and daddy. And he said, who's going to make me? Well, you know, you don't say that to an old Southern Methodist. <laughs> I mean, inside of me, everything sort of came to the surface. And I said, I'll tell you something, boy. Say, <laughs> you get on down there and get your stuff packed. I'm going to go get your mama and daddy, and I will meet you there. So he and his little friend took off. And uh, when I got down to the cabin... He was gone. And one of the boys came up and said to me, and I had his mom and daddy with me, and they came up to me and said, um, called the boy's name, said, they've gone off into the woods. I said, beautiful. I said, what are we going to do? I said, lock the doors. <laughs> Let them sleep in the woods. I said, there ain't a copperhead or a moccasin in Georgia mean enough to bite him. <laughs> Let him sleep out there. So we did. 4.30 in the morning, this old boy comes tooling back up to the cabin with his friend. And they have to sleep on the porch. Now, I want you to know this did not make me popular with his mama and daddy. <laughs> but I felt like they had the option of either going along with what we felt was necessary or going home. I mean, it, either way, it was all right. At that time, I probably would have preferred the latter. But for a couple of days there... You know, they didn't have much to do with me. And I was angry. 
very, very angry. And one morning, we'd coming out of a staff meeting, and by the time I got on the steps of that room where we had staff meeting, the Lord said to me, you need to go and apologize. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> Did you set in on the same conversation I sat in on? <laughs> you think I need to go apologize to that boy? He said, yeah. I said, all right. Well, you know I didn't want to, right? Now, between the time he spoke to me and the time I got to this boy's room, I had to go to Calvary several times. I mean, several times. Because it wasn't with my love that I was going. It was his love for me and my recognition that if he could love me, he could sure love that boy, even though I questioned that a little bit at the time. So I get over there to the boy's room, and I knock. No boy, six foot four, just 14 years old. I was hoping his brain would get in line with his body, but when he opened the door, I said, can I come talk to you a little bit, you know? And he was real cordial. Huh? I said, all right. You interpret that to mean it's okay if you... So I went in, and we sat down, and I said to him, um, I just came to let you know that I'm sorry, that what I said to you the other day was true, and you needed to hear it, but you did not need for me to give it to you in anger. You needed for me to give it to you in love, and I didn't do that. I need your forgiveness for that. Uh, so about that time, his mom and daddy came through the door, and uh, then we sat there, the, all of us talked a little bit, and about the time I was getting ready to go, I did a Wayne West. I looked over at the father. You wouldn't do this. And I said, it's about time you accepted your place in this household and became head of it. This young man over here is your responsibility. Now, the best thing you can do is tell your wife to hush and do what God's leading you to do in this boy's life. And I left. Now, that didn't make me any more popular <laughs> with the family. Hard word, right? So I was gone just, just a few minutes, and the next thing on agenda was rhythms that morning. What had happened after I left the room was that the father went over to the boy and said, I'm going to tell you something, son. You may not like anything that's going on in this camp. And I'm not even going to ask you to like it, but what you will do is participate in everything that's going on. So he sort of snatched him up and sent him over to Rhythms. And when he got there, they were doing the Good Samaritan. And all it seemed as though all the kids who were his age, who had been so concerned about him for three days, happened to be there at that session of Rhythms. They'd been praying for him. So when they started doing the Good Samaritan, you've all done that in Rhythms here, haven't you? The innkeeper and the Good Samaritan, see, they get together, the kids, and they go over to this boy and they say, look, uh, we're the Good Samaritan, these folks here, the innkeepers, we're coming to you. We need a wounded and you look like you qualify. So they, they knelt down and they picked that old boy up and carried him over to a place right next to the platform. And then as they laid him down on the floor, they just sort of hovered over him and began to pray for him. And then in a few minutes, that old six-foot boy, six-foot-four boy shot straight up out in the middle of that circle, weeping and repenting and accepting Jesus into his heart. And in a moment's time, he was transformed. Still needed his mind renewed, but he was transformed. And all the change that I would have sought to bring by the rules or by two by four if I could have got my hands on it could not have done what that move of the Spirit did on the inside, bringing transformation. Far too long in our relationships with people, we've put people under bondage by trying to bring change. What we need to learn to do is to love each other as we've been loved. And then by the power of the Spirit in love, relate to one another to push in for transformation. One of the main things, and I don't want you to receive this as critical, because I think it's reality. One of the main things that's wrong with our mainline denominational churches, and I'll be one of them at least for a while, 
is that we have settled for change. We have stopped pushing in with a Jesus who is the resurrected Lord of glory, who today wants to give his people new natures. I told you about my son John. You don't need to know all of what John went through. I ain't got time to tell you what we went through. But this past May, my son John hit the bottom. And he came and spent the night with me when I was preaching a revival in Durham, North Carolina. And he was flat out at the bottom. And Betty Jo and I knew just from a brief conversation that we had to do something with John. We either had to put him somewhere where he could have some care. Or we had to get him off somewhere where the Lord could minister to him. So I took him up to our camp and left him. He stayed there four or five days with two young men, Daniel. Daniel being one of them. <clears throat> and then another young man named Ben. And for four or five days, they loved him. They shared with him. And then he came home at the end of the week just to pick up his clothes so he could go back to camp because we were going to leave him up there and let him work with his hands, dig ditches, do whatever. And he came home and uh, wanted us to go to church with him that, that morning they were leaving to go back to camp. But it wasn't so that I could go, so he had to go with his two friends. And they went over to this wild-eyed church over in Greenville, North Carolina. And when they, when they gave the invitation, John went down and, uh, and rededicated his life to the Lord and opened himself up for that transformation one more time. And for the whole summer, the boy grew until finally I was able to go up there and he was telling us that he wanted a Bible, <laughs> and a new Bible, and I had just bought one. Uh, a little study Bible that I like. And uh, so I can remember Betty Jo and I were there outside the cabin. And I was able to write inside the cover of the Bible that a, a, a young man really becomes a man when he learns how to get outside of himself and begin to care for others. And I was able to tell him that and then to say that your mother and I really rejoice in your manhood, and all that uh, the Lord is doing. So John stayed up there, and the Lord began to work in him and to renew his mind so that his outward behavior really manifested incredible change. And he was broken from underneath the shackles of a deep relationship with a Philistine woman uh, that almost buried him. And he was able to love his mother and his daddy and his sister and his brother and be free and manifest behavior that was radically different. So that when we got ready to move to Delaware, John left before we did and moved on to Delaware. And this is what I wanted to share with you before I close. Some years ago, about five years ago, I was preaching in a little church in Delaware called Zor United Methodist Church. And uh, at that time, Betty Jo and I were going through a thing with John, with his behavior and so on, that was so painful that on this particular night when I was up there to preach, the only thing I could do was stand in the pulpit and cry. And finally, I just invited the people in the church to come pray for me and with me. And the whole congregation came down and knelt there at the altar, and we just prayed. And they ministered in a beautiful way uh, to my hurt and prayed for John. <laughs> Well, not long after we had been in Delaware this past fall, uh, this church was having Kenny Davis over to sing. And John wanted to go hear Kenny Davis. I couldn't go until after the Bible study. But when I walked in that church, here was John now, in the same church where the people had prayed for him and for me in such a powerful way. Sitting down there on the left-hand side with his little arms, blessing the Lord, praising God. When I came in the back of that church, I looked at the people and I saw John. I thought, oh my, you know, 
What about the transforming power of God? What a mighty God we serve. And that church has been through such pain in the last three years with a man that I'm convinced was demon-possessed as their pastor. I mean, it was incredible. So that the church was down to a handful of people now. At the end of that service, I was able to stand and introduce John to the people who had prayed for him. And able to say to them, the same kind of God who has brought this transformation in the life of my son can restore the life of this church and can bring the transformation that will set you folks free one more time. It was powerful to see what God had done. And so the only thing I'm really trying to say to you and beating around with this is we don't need to settle for change. Change will not last unless it comes out of transformation that takes place on the inside. It may be that you've got children or grandchildren that right now, this day, you don't really sense there's a lot of hope for in terms of what they're into or what they've been through. Maybe a marriage that you don't really feel can make it, you know? I just want you to know that God's transforming power is able to take every situation in life and through that simple touch, set people free. That's the nature of our God. His heart to give us a new nature. That we would not be conformed to the world. But that we would be transformed and set free. I want to thank you for letting me share with you this morning. I want to thank you for being a part of that ongoing transformation in my life, and in the lives of the people that you're with here this week. Because God uses you as instruments by which the minds of those around you can be renewed as together you feed your spirit the things of God and participate in that ongoing transformation that God wants to bring. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting us share with you uh, on this particular occasion.